Deep learning is a new name for an old thing. It's about training artificial neural networks with many subsequent computational stages. Does anybody in this audience know what is an artificial neural network? Hands up. Ooh, I'm very impressed. Does anybody not know what is an artificial neural network? All right, one guy. Oh, there are another two guys. By the way, is this being taped or not? It is? <laughs> we always memorize everything what you are saying. <laughs> you probably know that um, biological brains consist of about 10 billion computational neurons, each of them connected to 10,000 other neurons on average. And this makes about 100,000 billion connections. And all your experience and all your soul is encoded in the strengths of these connections and the synapses. And mathematical models of neural networks just try to, to build an analog in a computational sense. And here we see the most general type of neural network, which is a recurrent network, where over time you have um, video, for example, streaming in there, and you have a couple of input units, and these input units get activated in proportion to the pixel intensities of the video that is coming in. And each of these units here is just computing a weighted sum of the activations of the units it is connected to at the previous time step. And this is a universal or a general computer and any program that I can run on this laptop, I can also run on a general computer like this recurrent neural network. The program is a weight matrix. The goal of learning is to find a good weight matrix such that this thing computes things that we wanted to compute. For example, when there comes in the video stream, we hope that the network will learn somehow to adjust its connection such that the important events in this video stay in memory for a while until they are needed to compute some output action that, for example, steers a car or another robot. In the supervised case, which is the easiest case, where there is a teacher who already knows what the network should output across certain output units, at a certain point in time. For example, in comes a sequence of observations, a speech signal, and then you say, this is the word hat, or it's the word box, or whatever. That's what the network is supposed to learn. And um, there's an, an algorithm which dates back about 50 to 30 years, which is called backpropagation. How many people in this room know backpropagation? How many people in this room do not know back backpropagation? All right, so backpropagation is just a way of computing a gradient with respect to some error function, some objective function that is differentiable in, in the activations of these differentiable units, which all have differentiable activation functions, and you want to compute a gradient of this error function with respect to every single parameter, every single weight in the system. That's backpropagation. And the way to do it is that you propagate errors backwards from the output units where you measure the error, um, and then they flow backwards. And the efficient way of doing it is, is, is exactly as um, computationally expensive as the forward path during information processing. This was first described in 1961 in the context of the calculus varia of variations and Euler-Lagrange equations. And uh, for, this was for dynamical systems uh, where you have a controller that um, influences this system and you use backpropagation or a variant of continuous backpropagation to adjust these controllers. This dates really back to the early 60s, Bryson, Kelly, Dreyfus had a way of deriving this whole thing without using dynamic programming ideas as the other guys, uh, using only the chain rule. Who of you guys knows the chain rule of differentiation? Yeah. So basically, backpropagation is just an application, a backward application of the chain rule. Now, the first guy who described, in, as far as I know, modern backpropagation was Linainma, Seppo Linainma in 1970 
in a master's thesis in Finland. And uh, this was really for the modern version of backcrop where you have a discrete graph, sparsely connected, and then you would just uh, propagate backwards the errors through this graph such that you, um, you can compute the gradient of, um, of some, some error function with respect to all the differentiable elements in the, in the graph. But during all the first 20 years, apparently nobody applied this to neural networks. So the first concrete application to neural networks, that was apparently Paul Burpus in 1981. And it was not in his thesis of 74, which is sometimes cited, no, it was in this paper of 1981. And then in the 80s, lots of people used backpropagation and applied it to neural networks. And uh, one paper that made it very popular, uh, contributed a lot to the popularity, was by Rumelhardt and Hinton and Williams in 86. And then um, there were extensions of um, backpropagation for recurrent networks. And I'm always citing uh, Williams and Werbers and Robinson and Forsyth. So backpropagation, a very old method, but central to what is now called deep learning. By the end of the 1980s, it became clear that backpropagation does not really work well in deep networks with many layers or in recurrent networks where you have to propagate signals far in, back in time. And that was my first deep learning project ever. Figure out what is the reason for that. And this is a picture of Sepp Hochreiter, my very first student, who in 1991 in his master's thesis showed explain the reason for that, why deep learning in deep networks doesn't work. Because these error signals, as you're propagating them back, they get smaller and smaller. They decay exponentially fast, exponentially in the number of layers you propagate them back. Sepp Hochreiter, my first student, but now he's a professor in Linz. My first attempt to build a deep learner, my first working deep learner dates back to the same year, and it tried to overcome this problem as follows. You don't have only one recurrent network, but you have a whole stack of recurrent networks, like this one here. So the first recurrent network just tries to encode the incoming observation stream in a more compact form. How? It just tries to predict the next element given the previous elements that it had seen so far. Now obviously, after it has been try trained for a while, whenever you can predict something exactly, whenever you can predict it well, it means the information about the thing you can predict is already contained in the network. Only the unpredictable pieces of the input stream represent new information. You can encode the entire sequence just by the unpredictable things that you have to store extra, but from there you can reconstruct the entire sequence. Is that clear? Is it clear? Yes. So you can now send up this compress compressed, compactified description of the sequence, which consists of the errors, essentially, of the lowest level. You send it up to the next level, where there's another recurrent network which gets only the unpredictable inputs and tries to predict the next thing, given the unpredictable things that it has seen so far. If there is a higher level unpredict uh, or predictability in the input stream, then this higher level network may rather easily discover it and figure it out, because it doesn't have to propagate errors so far back, because the distances are shorter. And the higher level is ticking on a slower time scale, and so on. So, you, you get a generative model, essentially, where each level represents the incoming input stream in more and more compact form in an unsupervised fashion. And then the top level maybe has a rather compact description of the entire sequence. And you can easily learn from that uh, what is the supervised classification of this sequence. So on top of that, supervised learning can become very easy as long as you have predictabilities redundancies in the temporal input stream. And with this, we could suddenly solve deep learning tasks of depth 1,000 or 1,200. We could learn deep learning tasks that were not learnable before. 
But this was the first recurrent deep learner that really worked and, um, and it, um, it started uh, this whole business. I'm thankful to the uh, German Science Foundation and to the Swiss National Found Fund that they funded this work in the 90s. Um, I had a couple of explicit deep learning research grants back then where um, SNF got convinced that this is really worth pursuing and then we, over time, developed better and better uh, algorithms for dealing with these deep networks where you don't have just shallow networks but really deep networks where you have lots of computational um, stages across uh, which you have to assign credit. And, um, Besides SEP, there are people like Felix Gears and Santiago Fernandez who were funded by this, and more recently we had Alex Graves and then Dan Shirazan and uh, other members of the uh, deep learning team include Uli Meyer or included Uli Meyer, now working for Apple, Jonathan Maschi, uh, Alessandro Giusti, and, and uh, Luca Gamadella. Now, in 1995, we found a way of having an a purely supervised deep learner, which was called long short-term memory. It's a recurrent network that overcomes the fundamental deep learning problem through a very simple, stupid trick. You have a, something like this red unit, which is just a linear unit, and it cannot do anything but just sum up the stuff that is coming in, and then it has a recurrent connection of weight 1.0 to itself, and it has just a linear activation function, uh, an identity function, and now you see immediately that the derivative of this function is one always, which means error signals that are propagating back in this red guy, they can propagate not only for 10 steps or 100 steps or 1,000 steps, they can propagate all the way down millions of steps without being changed. Now, this is only a linear unit which is not really doing much because there are lots of uh, tasks that require nonlinear information processing. But you can surround these red linear units by a cloud of nonlinear things, where you have multiplicative, uh, highly nonlinear units surrounding these linear guys, and they take advantage of the error signals that are propagated back for thousands of steps in these um, linear units. And then from there, from the linear units, they propagate down into the nonlinear parts of the network. And so the network really can assign credit across thousands of steps, and suddenly lots of deep learning tasks that were not even solvable by the, um, by the, by the RNN stack, by this history compressor that I mentioned uh, in, the, in the second slide or something, um, many of these additional deep learning tasks became learnable. And our competitors back then were always sequence learners such as hidden Markov models, which were state of the art in speech processing back then. Does anybody know what is a hidden Markov model? Okay, you are really specialists, I'm surprised. Hidden Markov models cannot learn, by definition, context-free languages or context-sensitive languages, and so we showed that these recurrent networks can do this. So they are more powerful. But back then, computers were so slow, and we had just these little toy experiments just to, just to show that these things can do things, can learn tasks that other models cannot learn, yes. But they were really small and not commercially relevant. But computers kept getting faster and faster. And finally, um, in, in recent years, lots of stuff uh, has become possible which seemed uh, like science fiction back then. For example, in speech recognition, uh, around 2005, for the first time, we were able to match the performance of hidden Markov models in interesting, challenging speech recognition tasks. That was about no, almost 10 years ago, and since then, things uh, progressed further. This is a picture of Santi, and um, in, in 2007, for example, uh, we had the best results on keyword spotting in a large corpus. Keyword spotting, that is, when, when you listen into to telephone speech and, and you hear a word such as Al-Qaeda, and then a red flag is raised. And fortunately, this does not only have um, military applications, but also commercial applications such as industrial um, espionage. And then in 2009, for the first time, a recurrent neural network won one of these international competitions. This was about handwriting. 
handwriting recognition of the ICTA International Conference and on Document Analysis and Recognition 2009 through Alex Graves, my former PhD student and then postdoc. And, uh, and there you get handwriting, you got handwriting like this and it's unsegmented. So it's not segmented in separate uh, letters. The network has to learn to do the segmentation and the rec recognition of the segmented stuff. And you just showed lots of uh, training examples. And in the French handwriting recognition competition, where there was a secret test set by the organizers, this thing came out first. So that won the competition, although the competitors had much more prior knowledge, or some of them had much more knowledge. They really, some of them really knew something about French. And our French is really not so good. And then, and then the same system was applied to Arab handwriting, and also one, and to Farsi, and also one, just from training examples, just maximizing the probabilities of the letter sequences in the training set, of the label sequences in the training set, given these long, real-valued input sequences. So there's a way of maximizing that probability and, and, and computer gradient and propagate it down through these um, LSTM networks. And more recently, uh, these LSTM networks, uh, again, Alex, set uh, the world record on the TIMID speech recognition database on phoneme recognition, uh, which is a big challenging thing, outperforming hidden Markov models clearly, although hidden Markov models have behind them thousands of man years of development. But of course, a recurrent neural network is something that is in principle much more powerful, it has this distributed way of encoding complex things across many units, not just one hidden unit, which is now act representing the probability that uh, the system is now in this particular one single state or something. So. There's so much power in these recurrent networks. And now, through the faster computers, we are really about to exploit this. But we are also working on feed-forward neural networks, which are simpler, where you don't have recurrent connections. So these are not general computers. But for many computer vision tasks, they are just the right thing to do. And this is an example of the probably most famous benchmark in, in machine learning, which was introduced in 1989, a long time ago, by Jan Lecun and his group. It's called the MNIST uh, speed, um, Digit Recognition Benchmark. Has anybody heard of this MNIST benchmark? All right, excellent. Has anybody not heard about this? OK, it doesn't matter. So it's one of these, <laughs> one of these benchmarks that are um, uh, kind of challenging, or uh, a while ago used to be um, challenging. And then over the years, many, many different uh, machine learning methods were applied to this, and lots of benchmark records on MNIST were broken, and broken, and broken. And so what we did, we took a deep multi-layer perceptron with many layers, and we trained it by backprop. And we got the best result in the history of MNIST using this. The only additional idea was Besides the backprop, which was three to five decades old by then, and that was in 2010, so backprop was developed in various uh, versions between 1960 and 1980. The one additional thing was we, we increased the effective training set by making additional training examples out of the existing ones simply by shifting them a little bit, making them a little larger, rotating a little bit, you know, the things that you do automatically just by moving your eyes around, getting closer and stuff. And then also, which also was an old idea, we didn't propose that, warping them, which is good for handwriting but not for general images. And, um, and these old ideas, 1990, bad, two decades old by then, another idea, three to five decades old by then, combined, Best results on MNIST, just plain backprop through these deep networks. How is that possible? Well, the, the reason was that this um, was implemented on GPUs, which were 50 times faster than the same things on, G, on CPUs. And this really made all the difference. And this prompted many people to, th to say, well, <laughs> apparently hardware advances are more important than all these software advances and algorithmic advances that we had in the last 20 years. But of course, that's not quite true, because you can, again, 
clearly improve the results if you use more sophisticated feedforward networks. And uh, one particular thing that is now widely used are max pooling convolutional neural networks. Convolutional neural networks have a long history, going back to Fukushima, 1979, where you have lots of, um, where you have receptive fields of a single unit with fixed weights, which is shifted across an entire image, and then you get lots of different responses for the different parts of the image, and that forms a first convolutional layer, and this is then moving into a competition layer, where the winning units, local winners um, are selected, uh, which, which is a form of downsampling, and then again you have another uh, convolutional layer, another competition layer, and so on, and so on. And Fukushima used uh, either pre-wired networks of this type or learned by unsupervised learning. So the guy who first propagated through a system like this, that was Janneke in 1989. And max pooling, that is a a variant of competition which was introduced in 1999. Again, 10 years later, you see, 1979, Fukushima, 89, backcrop through um, CNN, max pooling, 10 years later, um, which is something that is particularly convenient for these CNN, max pooling CNN. And uh, the first, uh, again, who propagated through MPCNN was Ranzato and colleagues in 2007. Shera showed that this is really a good idea. and. Um, and Lacan's lab, in particular, had lots of improvements and simpli simplifications of um, convolutional neural network networks of this time. And we put it all on GPU, and then it was much faster and was able to even outperform the plane networks on uh, things such as um, MNIST, or also in 2011, that was Chinese handwriting recognition. That's interesting, because unlike in Latin, digits where you have only 10 classes, here you have 4,000 classes. So you have a network with 4,000 output units. And this system easily won the competition and also got best results on MNIST, human competitive results on MNIST uh, of about 0.2% error. And here you see these images of digits that are really hard to classify. So I have a hard time classifying many of these correctly. I think we have reached the limit of MNIST, and generally speaking, MNIST is, by today's standards, too small uh, a test set or training set now. If we look into the networks after training, we discover, hey, they are all the time reinventing things that have been known in computer vision for many decades. Gabor filters, on-center, off-surround filters, off-center, on-surround filters, orientation-sensitive bar detectors that are maximally active if there are certain edges in the visual um, input at certain places. So that's what you find in the periphery. The deeper you go down in the network, the more complex the feature detectors become, and they just reflect what's frequently occurring in the data. Some abstraction of what's frequently occurring in the data. For example, if there are things such as eights and threes which have similar structures like this, then there will be some grandmother neuron or a small set of grandmother neurons which becomes responsive just to this. There are grandmother neurons sometimes for stuff that is frequently reoccurring. And there are other more complex and less clear uh, ways of distributing what's happening there, of distributed representations. It's all about compression, because our networks are pretty small. They have just a few millions of weights. But out there, there are billions and billions of pixels in the training set. So you really have to compress the essence of what is in this big data set into a few million weights. You don't even have to worry a lot about regularization and making and finding simple ways. No, 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 the network is so small, it really has a hard time encoding all of these things anyway. Then in um, 2011, it was also an interesting uh, contest in Silicon Valley. Uh, it was about traffic signs. How much time have I got, uh, by the way? 45 minutes. 
Oh, still 45 minutes. That's good. All right. Yeah, I think we started 20 past, right? It's <laughs> usual. Yeah. And, and, and this was interesting um, because there was a, a qualifying stage first where any team in the world could use its favorite machine learning algorithm to train it on the, on the training set, which was given by the organizers. But they had a se separate test set, of course, a secret test set. And then you could try to train on the training set and submit to the organizers, and they would test then, uh, the performance on the test set. And, and until the... The last day of this qualifying phase, we thought we had a comfortable lead. But then on the last uh, day, Pierre Samanet from Jan Lecun's lab in New York University, he um, submitted an entry, which was slightly better than ours. <laughs> and then Jonathan and um, Dan and Uli had to work late night to submit yet another entry just to reestablish the correct order. <laughs> and then in, um, in the final competition, however, there were huge differences. Everybody had time to improve a little bit uh, further the system, and, um, and ours got first. So here is Dan with the price. Um, first, 0.56% um, um, error on the, on, the, on the unknown test set. The second best performance was not another machine learning um, method, but it was humans, who had about 1.16% correct, uh, uh, wrong. And the third place was then um, for our colleagues and competitors from New York University. Jan Lecun um, is now, was hired by Facebook recently. And the fourth best thing was the first machine learning method that was not a neural network. So I, what was it? Some random forest plus something? I forgot. Of course, in Switzerland, if you do not obey a traffic sign, you go to jail. But the Swiss AI lab, it's here, it's in Lugano, and right across the border there's Italy. <laughs> where they also have traffic signs on the street but only for purposes of decoration. <laughs> Why would you need traffic sign detectors or uh, recognizers anyway? Well, for self-driving cars. Now we have 2014. 2014, that's the 20 year anniversary of self-driving cars in traffic on the highway. Because this man, Ernst Stickmans, in 1994, had the first self-driving cars in, on highways, uh, first around the Paris Autobahn lane around the city, and then in 1995 he had this, this great experiment where a self-driving Mercedes S-Class went from Munich all the way to Denmark and back on the highway going up to 180 kilometers per hour. 20 years ago, 180 kilometers per hour, much faster than today's self-driving cars. No GPS, plain vision active cameras looking far ahead, 300 meters ahead, because the car was going so far, you really had to focus your attention on, on, on the important th stuff. Driving much more like humans than today's cars, which drive by GPS, basically. 20 years ago. And uh, of course, there was a safety driver on board for legal reasons or for construction areas. But often, for 100 kilometers and more in a row, no intervention of the safety driver at all. We used the same system also for image segmentation. Deep networks can be shifted across huge images such that um, you have targets at each point which just tell you is this um, pixel that I'm currently observing, does that belong to background or to foreground, for example. So that's how you can segment big images. There was an image segmentation competition, which was pretty important by today's, because today we have these big projects. The Human Brain Project, here headed in Switzerland at EPFL, then also rather big um, American brain projects. And there, one of the goals is you slice the brain into little slices, 
you put the slices into an electron microscope, you get EM images from there, stacks of EM images, and then you employ a horde of students <coughs> for hours and days and weeks just to label a single stack and say, this is background, this is membrane, this is background, synapse, you know. This needs to be automated. And so uh, in 2012, there was a competition, the Brain Image Segmentation Contest, is EISBI 2012, and um, lots of labs participate in this one. And the method that I just described, again, essentially, came out first again. That was the first pure image segmentation contest won by deep learning, to my knowledge. However, earlier with the recurrent networks, with the LSM recurrent networks that did the automatic uh, handwriting recognition for connected handwriting, there at the same time you had to have segmentation and recognition. So that's why I'm saying the first pure segmentation contest. And the same thing can be used for object detection. Now in computer vision, the most important thing often is not really to classify objects that you see and to recognize them, but to have a big scene, a visual scene, and then detect some object you're interested in. And this is a pretty important application of object detection because it's about discovering cancer cells or pre-cancer cells in human tissue of, um, of breast tissue. And so there's a training set by a, labeled by an expert histologist. And he says, this is mitosis, and this is not, and this is, and this is not. So you get lots of training examples like this, and then you're trying to imitate the expert. And the way to do it is you shift your feed-forward network, which is supposed to give you the answer, across the entire visual scene, and whenever, once you train it, then you can look at all the parts of the image where it lights up, where it becomes active. So then you say, oh, there's a mitosis. And this works rather well. So good and well enough such that it won this object detection contest there against lots of other competitors. <coughs> I'm sorry. Lots of other competitors, also from industry, because that's a huge industry problem. You have to see, while, G while GDP is about 60 trillion, 10% of that goes into healthcare, 6 trillion per year. And a big part of that is really medical diagnosis. And perhaps, these deep learning methods here are really going to improve the situation for many people who at the moment do not really have access to expert histologists of this type. So maybe this can really help to uh, improve healthcare, maybe even save human lives. So when we started this a long time ago, this was not really on our agenda, but now it's really becoming of interest in, in this very fundamental way too. The same system was then used again with slight improvements in 2013 for a very similar but larger contest. That was the Mikai 2013 Grand Challenge. Again, mitosis detection, which is really an important thing, uh, pre-cancer cell detection. And again, um, thanks to Dan Chirajan and Alessandro Giusti, um, this was won by our deep neural networks. What you really want to do, however, is you want to build intelligent agents. So far, I just talked about um, pattern classification and sequence recognition and segmentation. But what you really want to do is you want to interact with the world, you want to manipulate robots, you want to learn to do that in a good way such that goals are reached, success is achieved. So that is the full motor sensory loop. Here we see Alexander Gloy Förster, whose claim to fame is not only that he is the chef of my robot lab, but also in 2004, he was the leader of the team that won the um, RoboCup World Championship in the Fast League, the only league where a human expert with a joystick cannot beat the best teams because they are so fast. And, uh, each of these little robots here has four motors and has a 
neural network on board, a controller, which um, learns to control these uh, wheels. And in fact, it has a predictor on board that tells the system what's going to happen if I send this steering signal to my four ro um, motors. Each of the motors is different. So first there's a training phase where the network learns to predict what's going to happen. But then you can use, you can use this model, this world model essentially, to plan ahead into the future. Tick, 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 tick. You simulate the future a little bit, but then there's still something that you can optimize, which is the action sequence that you will inject into this model such that it achieves a desired sub-goal, such as quickly approach the ball, but then break in time without bumping the ball away or without running into an opponent. So these little sub-goal things are all the time being optimized using a, a neural world model, which is different for each of these little robots. This stack is a pretty deep thing because each network is followed by another network, another one, another one, and then in this rather deep system, you have to optimize the action sequence. And the basic idea goes again back to huh, beginning of the 90s or something, but, um, but that was really useful to win the world championship. So another interesting application of what today would be called uh, deep learning. Generally speaking, you want to learn policies in general for deep recurrent neural networks that, um, that do interesting things. Let me see whether I can start. The this is an old movie from about 10 years ago. It's about a little robot that has three wheels controlled by a recurrent neural network. There are sensors which are shown here through this, these little bars which come out of the robot. And it has learned to balance a pole, but there was no teacher. Um, this thing was just evolved through evolution because it had to, there was no teacher which told the system what to do at which point in time. No, there was only a reward function, and basically that was the length of the trial before crash. And you had to maximize that. So the objective like this cannot be minimized through backpropagation, which is supervised. No, you have to learn even the actions themselves and discover good actions and so on. That's the general problem of AI do the full motor loop, sensory motor loop, and come up with a good policy that does it. And in many cases, evolution is doing a good job at evolving weight matrices like that. But back then, also here, these recurrent networks had just a few hundred parameters, and they had rather compact information about the state. So it was non-Markovian in the sense that you really needed a memory of recent things to do the right thing in the future. However, um, you had rather compact um, state descriptions like where's my robot x, y coordinate and stuff like that. And, and this is also not the way it should be. What you really want to have is a robot that learns from raw vision everything. And uh, this was a double uh, pole balancer, the, the pole balancer down there, which also learned to balance another pole standing on top of the first one. And this goes almost 10 years back. Now, today, however, we can do deeper things. Like um, driving a car from raw vision input. That was published in 2013 at Gecko. So there is a big network which has a million weights, not just a few hundred weights, but a million, a recurrent network that is completely unstructured in the beginning and it gets raw video input from a simulated racing game, a video game, from this car, which sees this more or less. And this is coming into the system, tick, 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 as it is steering, you know, full sensory motor loop, and it doesn't know anything about vision. And we didn't pre-train the uh, vision in unsupervised fashion or something, or in supervised fashion. We didn't plug in the vision that we, uh, copied from some supervised network or something like this. No, nothing. And this million weight network was able to learn a policy that was able to drive the car from raw vision. Now, I told you that it's really, really difficult to evolve something that has a million parameters. Nobody really can do that. And I told you that evolution is restricted maybe by a few hundred parameters. That's why you still can evolve, maybe a few thousand at most. But this is a million. 
and it learns everything, the vision, the video uh, processing, the temporal sequence, uh, and the control, everything from scratch. How is that possible? Well, it turns out that you can greatly compress the search space here. And I mentioned before, machine learning is all about compression. 99% of machine learning are really about compression. Occam's razor, find the simple solution, the, ones that has the, the one that has the minimal uh, description length and everything. And, um, and what we have here is a, a rather universal programming language. And we look at the weight matrix of a recurrent network as if it was an image. And then we compress that so its image using Fourier analysis or actually wavelet decomposition or actually what we really do, discrete cosine transform uh, to, to greatly compress the number of effective parameters. And it turns out that a policy like that, which consists of a million weights, can actually be compressed down to about a few hundred, maybe 300 coefficients in which we really search. So we don't search in the weight space, no, we search in this much smaller space of programs written in this DCT language, which encode the big network. And that's where we optimize. And that's how it's possible uh, to learn vision and control and everything in sequential fashion in, uh, from scratch. This was done with Faustino Gomez, Jan Kutnik, Giuseppe Cucu. You know, before I came here, I thought this is going to be just another tech talk and there won't be much of an audience, but you are actually a large audience by my standards. The other day, I, I gave a talk, and there was just a single person in the audience. <laughs> Your host. A young lady. I, I said, young lady, it's very embarrassing, but apparently today I'm going to give this talk just to you. And she said, um, OK, uh, but please hurry. I'm the next speaker. <laughs> Thanks, Dana. So here we see the compression from one million weights down to about 200 DCT coefficients, which are being evolved by a method called natural evolution strategies, also developed at the Swiss AI lab. It's here. And so the compression here is pretty good, one to 5,000. Now, this is a lot like regularization, but it's constructive regularization. So you immediately try to search the space of programs that compute the policies. And because you're searching in this restricted space, you can really achieve something as opposed to searching in the raw space. I think I have to finish now because my time is almost over. I, um, would be able to talk a lot about stuff that goes beyond deep learning, about universal problem solvers, which are really universal, mathematically optimal in a certain um, very general sense, which were also pioneered in my lab uh, in the new millennium. But this would be a different talk. And today I'm focusing just on these um, rather recent or recently so-called deep learning methods. And um, I wish to thank the the organizers for doing a great job and for the check which I'm going to spend on my kids. <laughs> and I wish to thank my mom and my dad without whom all of this would not have been possible. And I, I wish to thank my kids without whom all of this would not have been um, necessary. <laughs> And I wish to thank you, my lovely audience, for your patience. So I guess there is time for a few special questions. Now it's the time to get back up. Yes. Um, uh, what I understand is that in the uh, traffic sign Better than humans, is that correct? 
Yes. So is, is that the trend that you see? Oh yeah, I see that trend, and um, I, I just um, I we very clearly saw that trend because remember in in the 1990s, in the early 90s, when we started this, we had computers that were a million times slower than those of today, and we only could do these little tiny toy problems. However, the algorithms themselves, they have improved a bit, but not so much. The real advance was really in the hardware, and we are using now LSTM networks, which we used for little toy problems, but suddenly they are giving state-of-the-art results in speech recognition. And this would not be possible without much faster computers. Hey, you, you talked about the recognition of Chinese characters. Oh, yeah. I didn't understand it. What does it mean? Uh, does the computer understand some Chinese words, or could the computer translate Chinese characters into Latin? And if it's yes, then which Chinese? <laughs> yeah. So, because the pronunciation is different. Yeah. You sound like a guy who knows more about Chinese than I do. Let me just tell you what the system can do. No matter what Chinese it is, it can learn to recognize these characters just from exposure to training examples. And who is interested in that stuff? Well, the smartphone companies are interested in that stuff because the idea is you, you go to China, you sit down in the restaurant, you look at the menu, you don't understand the menu, you take out your smartphone, you look through the camera, and it recognizes what is written there and superimposes on what you see, the, the Latin translation. To do this, you, the system doesn't have to be very intelligent. It just has to do the character recognition right, and ours are pretty good at doing this, so at the moment, state of the art, and then have a little dictionary where you translate that. Uh, this does not really mean that this network understands Chinese. Uh, which means, so you, I think you understand Chinese once you are able to write Chinese poetry, which convinces other Chinese guys. And this will take another five years. 